Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I'm president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Eric Fingerhut, former Chancellor of the Ohio Board of Regents. During the past year at the City Club of Cleveland, we have heard several speakers address challenges and opportunities for public education in the United States. One point on which there has been unanimous agreement is on the importance of public education and ensuring the nation's competitiveness in a global economy. Today we welcome a man who has dedicated his professional life to public service in multiple respects, including in the areas of workforce development and education. Mr. Fingerhut graduated from Cleveland Heights High School, and for those listening on the radio network across the country, that is an inner ring suburb of Cleveland, the public school there. And after Cleveland Heights High School, he attended Northwestern University, where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree with highest honors. He then earned his law degree from Stanford University, and after graduating from Stanford, came to Cleveland as a bright and ambitious young lawyer who was committed to making a difference. And I can speak to Mr. Fingerhut's commitment because one of my early responsibilities as a law firm associate was to try to recruit him to the firm. Unfortunately, he chose to make a difference at another firm, but that's another story. <laughs> he later served as associate director of Cleveland Works, an agency that offered comprehensive job training programs for the poor, and as campaign manager and director of the transition team for then mayor of Cleveland, Mike White. Having experienced political success in the mayoral campaign, Mr. Fingerhut decided to run for office himself and was elected as representative of Ohio's 25th Senate District, serving in that capacity in 1991 to 1992 and again from 1999 to 2006. As a state senator, he served for eight years on the Finance Committee on, on committees related to health, aging, environment, insurance, tax policy, economic development, and education. In between his Ohio Senate stints, he was elected to serve as representative, representative of the Ohio 19th Congressional District in the United States House of Representatives. After his political career, Mr. Fingerhut served as the Director of Economic Development, Education, and Entrepreneurship at Baldwin Wallace College. He also has taught at Case Western Reserve University's Department of Political Science and School of Law and the Weatherhead School of Management. On March 14, 2007, Mr. Fingerhut was appointed the seventh chancellor of the Ohio Board of Regents and in that capacity served as a member of then Governor Strickland's cabinet. In March of the following year, Mr. Fingerhut presented a 10-year strategic plan for higher education for Ohio and for the next several years worked with various constituencies to implement the goals set forth in the plan. So Mr. Fingerhut has done a lot in a short period of time and he is still a very young man, at least by my standards. <laughs> I am pleased to present on behalf of the City Club of Cleveland, Eric Fingerhut, 7th Chancellor of the Ohio Board of Regents. Thank you, Paul. It's an honor and a privilege to be back at the City Club, uh, and it's a particular privilege to be introduced uh, by you. Uh, I understand your term as president is uh, starting to come to an end, and we thank you for uh, your service to this great institution uh, in our community. Well, this is the first opportunity that I have had to reflect publicly on my experiences as chancellor uh, of the Ohio Board of Regents, a position uh, that I relinquished a little over two months ago today. So let me begin by thanking many of you in the audience today for the support and encouragement you provided during these past four years. For me, it was a time of excitement uh, and great professional satisfaction. I owe much of the true joy I had in serving as chancellor, and it was a joy, to the many wonderful friends and colleagues across the state who joined with me in our efforts. I also would like to thank Governor Strickland and the Ohio General Assembly for giving me the opportunity to serve and for the support they provided me throughout the, my tenure. Now, some of you know that the Board of Regents is located across the street from the State House in the Rhodes Tower. There's a statue of Governor Rhodes, our state's longest serving governor, in front of the building. On the pedestal of the statue are several famous Jim Rhodes quotes. My favorite one is this. He said, all the social ills among able-bodied people come from the lack of a job. It is no secret, therefore, why we remember Jim Rhodes as the jobs governor. Now, there's been much written in recent months 
about Rhodes Raiders, a group of business people Jim Rhodes assembled to aggressively recruit companies to Ohio. But Rhodes Raiders were only one component of Governor Rhodes' job strategy, and frankly, a small component at that. The rest of the strategy was to build a world-class infrastructure to support business growth in Ohio. One of the most important elements of his infrastructure plan was higher education. Now, the cornerstone initiative of my time as chancellor was to bring together our public colleges, uh, colleges and universities to create the university system of Ohio. In many ways, both large and small, the university system of Ohio was erected on the foundation that Governor Rhodes laid. It is true, as I was fond of pointing out during my time as chancellor, many of you heard me say it more than once, that Ohio has been in the business of higher education as long as we have been a state. Our oldest public university, Ohio University, was carved out of the Northwest Territory by an act of Congress in 1803, the same year Ohio was admitted to the Union. But 160 years later, when Jim Rhodes was elected governor, the state had just six public universities. Ohio University, Miami University, Ohio State, Central State, Kent State, and Bowling Green. Only one of which you'll notice, Ohio State, was in a major urban center of our state. In 1963, there was also no such thing as a publicly supported community college. Institutions like Sinclair Community College in Dayton had been operating for years in YMCAs, offering night classes and vocational training. So under Jim Rhodes, Cleveland State University, the University of Cincinnati, Wright State University in Dayton, Youngstown State University, the University of Toledo, the Medical College of Ohio, which later merged into the University of Toledo, the University of Akron, and the Northeast Ohio University's College of Medicine all became state universities, more than doubling the number of public universities and planting a flag in every major Ohio city. Now, Governor Rhodes was clear about why he was building and expanding public universities. At the Board of Regents in the office, we have an original typed, uh, hand-typed version of a speech that Jim Rhodes delivered on October 2nd, 1962, in the stretch run of his first successful campaign for governor. In that speech, which was entitled Blueprint for Brain Power, that was his title in 1962, uh, Jim Rhodes said, Quote, we have only just crossed the threshold of the golden age of science. He then noted the benefits and the challenges of the scientific revolution and continued, the challenges thereby presented must be directed to higher education. We need brain power to continue these magnificent advances. We need the brain power to solve the new problems which they present, and we need to ever lead and never follow. Now, while Governor Rhodes clearly understood the importance of public universities, as you can tell from the quote I just read you, he also recognized the role that community colleges were to play in training workers for increasingly high-skilled jobs. Legislation that he proposed and supported gave counties the authority to establish community college districts and to seek levies to support them. Here in Northeast Ohio alone, we use this law to create Lakeland Community College, Cuyahoga Community College, and Lorain County Community College, three of the largest and most comprehensive community colleges in the state. In all, 23 community colleges were established across Ohio as a result of the legislation that Governor Rhodes uh, drafted and sponsored. Now, the result of all this growth was stunning. In 1960, the total enrollment in our public colleges and universities was 61,248. By 1969, nine years later, it was 265,532. Today, with the addition of 41 full-service adult career centers and dozens of adult literacy programs, total enrollment is over 600,000, making the University System of Ohio one of the largest comprehensive public systems of higher education in the nation. Now, lest anyone think that Governor Rhodes was sneaking the legislation to create these colleges and universities through the General Assembly when no one was looking, 
Uh, it is important to note that support for this expansion was very strong at the local level as well. Business leaders, newspapers, citizens groups, and legislators fought hard to get a state university in their community or to authorize a community college in their county. As clearly as Jim Rhodes saw higher education as an economic driver for the state, so too local leaders saw public universities and community colleges as economic necessities for their city or their county. And Ohio was not alone. Following the example of the most famous state higher education plan in our country's history, which was the plan in California uh, that created the California uh, systems of universities and state universities and community colleges, states like North Carolina and Texas also began investing in university systems that would soon come to play an important role in driving their state's economies. So now let's fast forward to today. Faced with serious budget and economic challenges across the country, many higher education experts have concluded that we face an inexorable decline in state support for public higher education. They look at budget cuts across the country and see nothing but glasses that are half empty. Now there are indeed some shocking examples. California's deep fiscal crisis has caused real challenges to what is the nation's and perhaps the world's model public university system. And the governor of Pennsylvania put himself on the map by proposing a 50% cut in state support for that state's public universities, a recommendation that fortunately the Pennsylvania state legislature appears not willing to follow. Well, call me an optimist, but I see these past years of state retrenchment much differently. I think that even in these challenging times, the public has expressed overwhelming support for their public colleges and universities and has communicated to their public officials their desire to see these institutions preserved and strengthened. We have just experienced the most severe state budget crisis since the Depression. State revenues have been down in real terms, not in inflation-adjusted terms. This recession was not only severe, it was swift, hitting fast and hard. The question was not whether states would cut higher education. Of course they would, just like they had to cut everything else. The question is whether states have singled out higher education for disproportionate cuts. Now there are exceptions, and I've noted some of them for you, but overall, I think the answer to that question is no. Look at it this way. In the search for dollars in recent years, Chicago sold off the Skyway and privatized its parking meters. Indiana sold the Turnpike. Ohio has considered selling the Turnpike, the state lottery, and state prisons. Can you imagine selling our colleges and universities? Now, don't worry. You won't have to get used uh, to Quicken Loans University or Continental Airlines Community College uh, anytime soon. No governor or legislator I know has proposed or would dare propose getting out of the business of public higher education altogether. It is not that higher education would go away. Obviously, we have wonderful private institutions as well as a growing for-profit sector. And I want to acknowledge uh, one of our great private institutions, Tom Chema, the president of Hiram College, who is here today. But none of these institutions has the special added responsibility to the success of the state and its people that our public colleges and universities have. Support for public higher education remains strong at the local level as well. During this recent recession, the four largest community colleges in the state, Cuyahoga, Lorraine, Lakeland, and Sinclair in Dayton, all had levy renewals on the ballot and all passed. This stands in contrast to other school funding measures. For example, at the same election that Lakeland Community College passed its levy in November of 2010, all four Lake County school levies on the ballot failed. During the depths of the recession, the voters also passed Issue 1, the Third Frontier Renewal and Expansion, a significant portion of which goes to fund research and commercialization efforts at universities. So this broad public support that I believe exists for 
public higher education in the state and the nation, suggests to me three points that I'd like to make to you today. First, I'm confident that the university system of Ohio will be an important part of the state's future. With two universities over 200 years old and three over 100 years old, with research totals and student enrollment that place the system among the top 10 in the nation, it seems a safe bet to me that Ohio's public universities aren't going to fade away. But I will go even further and predict that the competition, not only from other state systems, but also from other nations that are frantically copying our higher education model, will make it more important than ever to think and act like a system, not as individual schools standing alone in the world. We will increasingly act in concert. The university system of Ohio is here to stay because it reflects the demands of an increasingly competitive global environment for faculty, for students, and for research dollars. Second, our universities and community colleges are in fact contributing significantly to the economic prosperity of the students they serve, of Ohio businesses, and of the communities in which they are located. But so are universities and states against which we are competing for talent, business, and jobs. That is why states that continue to invest in higher education, even in the face of difficult budgets, will surpass those states that do not. Morris Beveridge, many of you know, the president of Lakeland Community College, and one of this state's most skilled higher education leaders, shared with me some astonishing results from surveys the school recently conducted in Lake County. The surveys found that 53% of the voters in that county had taken a class at Lakeland, 53%. 87% had a relative or friend who had taken a class, and fully 90% believed that the county was a better place to live because of the presence of the college. Now, as a former politician who knows something about poll results, uh, I can tell you that these are pretty remarkable numbers. The students get it. They know they need to go to school. They are very capable of understanding the different paths open to them to pursue higher education, including the increasingly popular option of starting at a community college and later transferring to a university. One of the key elements of the University System of Ohio that every course taken at one public university or community college in Ohio is transferable to every other university or community college. Indeed, you could say that that's the definition uh, of a system, is helping make college more affordable, more affordable every day. And when colleges and universities open programs at convenient times and locations, in fields of study that lead directly to good jobs, the classes fill up in no time. The impact on businesses in Ohio is equally dramatic. Now, there's a major shift underway in how businesses conduct their research and development. Rather than build all their own research facilities, as uh, was done in the days of the Bell Labs and other famous uh, corporate research facilities, businesses whose growth depends on solving complex technical problems finding it, find it increasingly beneficial to seek out and fund the best talent in the great research universities. That is why, while federal research support remains the largest single source of research dollars at universities, funding from private industry is in fact the fastest growing source of such funds. The University System of Ohio ranks among the top systems in the nation for receiving such industry support for research, with Ohio State alone ranked second among all universities in the nation in this regard. What this means is that Ohio's research universities, including uh, our two private research universities, Case Western Reserve and the University of Dayton, are working with hundreds, if not thousands, of companies every day, helping them to grow and create jobs here in Ohio. Some of these stories become public, but many more do not because of confidentiality agreements and intellectual property restrictions. But it is an essential part of Ohio's future economic prosperity as it is in other states with major research universities. Now, while not all of the economic impact that I've just discussed of working with businesses is felt directly in the community where the university is located, much of it is felt directly 
in those lo local communities. Uh, what Tom Friedman meant by the world is flat, something that has become part of our language, what he meant is that, of course, technology has made it possible for businesses to locate anywhere and to sell to customers anywhere. Now, Professor Richard Florida, who's author of The Creative Class, many of you are familiar with, agrees that it is theoretically possible for businesses to be located anywhere, but he then went on to show that economic growth is in fact clustered around those places that have the highest concentration of educated workers. For Professor Florida, the world is not flat, but spiky, to use his word. Now, I recently had the opportunity to serve on a panel at the Milken Global Institute with both Professor Florida uh, and with uh, Dr. Robert Bergenau, who's the Chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley, perhaps the greatest public university uh, in the world. Uh, and we were there to discuss the role of higher education in economic growth. Chancellor Bergenau produced a map that proved Professor Florida's thesis. He showed that the innovation and growth in California's economy is dramatically concentrated around the University of California's campuses. And the same is true in Ohio. Whether we're speaking of the dramatic growth in health and life sciences collected around our university campuses, or in aerospace, or in agriculture. And of course we know that the universities and colleges do more than stimulate job creation in our communities. They attract students and faculty that help make our cities vibrant places to live. This was, of course, Professor Florida's original point in the creative class. Third and finally, the future threats to the growth and success of public higher education in the United States, and therefore to the University System of Ohio, come not from antagonistic public officials or a disillusioned public, but from within the institutions themselves. If I am right that public support for higher education is based on the public's clear understanding of the link between the work of higher education and economic prosperity, then higher education must be vigilant to keep its links to the economy relevant and strong. Now this is not easy to do. The rapid changes in the makeup of the economy caused by globalization and technolo technological change mean that what businesses need workers to know, what they need from workers, is changing fast. Universities and community colleges' curriculum must change with them. And of course, the students themselves are changing. More are returning to school to get updated skills, even while they're caring for families and holding down jobs. And the so-called traditional students, this is the, the classic 18-year-old coming from, from high school to, to college, uh, are frankly often woefully unprepared for the most challenging coursework uh, that is needed to fill uh, the expectations uh, of business. And so they often gravitate to programs and majors that are easier to navigate, but that are also in less demand in the marketplace. Rapid change is not something that the organizational structure of higher education is designed to produce, to say the least. The result is a growing gap between the skills of the students we are producing and the skills businesses need. If higher education fails to address this growing gap effectively, it will risk losing the very basis of its public support, the support that has sustained it and propelled its growth for 200 years, and the promise that motivated Jim Rhodes to put expansion of higher education at the front of his jobs agenda for Ohio. The same is true of the need to find new and creative ways to work with businesses and support economic development more broadly. The truth is that most new business development does not come from the transfer of a technological breakthrough to the marketplace, as exciting and groundbreaking as that is uh, when it occurs and we see the new businesses growing. Most new business development and job creation comes from the application of existing knowledge to new situations creating new or improved products, or reaching hard to serve markets. What many faculty members may take for granted as old news in their field could be immensely valuable to an entrepreneur or even an established business. Opening the doors of universities to businesses in this way is also one of the things that many institutions of higher education find most challenging. It's not how they operate. This too, must change for our institutions 
to meet the needs of the state. Now, changing the way you do business is not easy or fun, but if it comes to a choice between cherished traditions and service to the very public that created and sustained these institutions year after year, then change must win out. I love and value higher education in general. I believe in its essential role in society. I am grateful for those like Tom Chema and others who uh, devote uh, themselves to building and sustaining the diverse array of higher education institutions in this country. And as Paul mentioned in his introduction, I'm a product of two of the great private universities in this country. It is truly a remarkable story that has been told ably by many authors and many speakers over the years. But my focus on the University System of Ohio, both as chancellor and in today's remarks, is because I'm particularly moved by the unique bond between people, between the people and their public institutions. This bond is not mysterious, and it is not about football, thank goodness. There are plenty of rabid fans at private universities, too. No, it is about the faith we have that higher education is essential to the prosperity and well-being of a state, and therefore our willingness as citizens to make significant investments year after year, decade after decade, and century after century. Even today, we are building and renovating buildings, establishing satellite campuses, adding new degree programs. Jim Rhodes would be proud. It is my hope, and it has been my goal, to make sure that the public institutions in this state live up to the high expectations of the people who built them and support them. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring Eric Fingerhut, seventh chancellor for the Ohio Board of Regents. We'll return to our speaker in a moment for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We'd ask you to start formulating your questions now and also respectfully re remind you to try to keep them short and to the point so we can get as many questions in as possible. Members and guests alike are welcome to attend City Club forums and we certainly hope that everyone listening will join the City Club in the coming year as we approach celebration of our 100th anniversary which happens in October 2012 and we'll begin that festive occasion with uh, a big program, a free speech conference in October of this year. So stay tuned for more details on that. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WVIZ PBS IdeaStream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC and our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. We are very pleased to welcome guests today at tables hosted by Burgess and Burgess, the friends of Jack Dover, and by Key Bank. Thank you all for joining us today. Today's program is the Sadie and Maurice Friedman Memorial Forum made possible by a generous gift from Robert M. Lustig and the late Howard R. Berger. Joining us at the head table today is Robert Lustig, who I must say is a wonderful supporter of the City Club in multiple respects. Robert, will you please stand and be recognized? Thank you for your incredible support. Now we would like to return to the perhaps the most important tradition of the City Club, the question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphone today is City Club intern Joe Andre and City Club program director Kerry Miller. First question, please. Okay, Eric, here's a softball. <laughs> you ended by saying that some of the challenges to the university system come from within. And I know from watching your uh, time in the office that you did have some uh, thoughts about how the whole structure of the system might be changed. Uh, I think particularly of something you and I have talked about, the notion that Cleveland State and Akron uh, and uh, Neo UCOM, I think, should all be one giant university. But how, how would you like to see the administration of this sprawling complex changed? Or is it structured fairly well? It just needs to respond to some of the values that you brought to our attention today. Um, I think the, 
I think there, there's always room to improve the organizational structure. You mentioned one idea that I, uh, that I floated. Uh, it, was, it was really well received. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for reminding me of that, uh, of that moment. Uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, you should have seen what the reception I got at the Akron City Club. Uh, that, uh, but the, um, uh, and I, and I do think that, there are, that there's room for uh, structural improvements. And, and frankly, we made a couple. Uh, in addition to the creation of the University System of Ohio, you know uh, that I was the product of a restructured, uh, I was the first chancellor to serve in a restructured uh, uh, Board of Regents system with the chancellor uh, serving in the governor's cabinet, being appointed uh, by, the, by the governor, uh, which had many benefits of alignment with, uh, uh, with the governor's office. Uh, and Governor Strickland, uh, frankly, gave me the great uh, privilege of participating in, uh, in working with trustees uh, to try to align trustees uh, across the system. Governors, uh, you may know, uh, appoint all the trustees of the public universities. They can do so for any, any reason that they, uh, that they deem appropriate. Uh, Governor Strickland, uh, uh, working with, uh, with my office, uh, made the, the absolute commitment that we were only going to appoint trustees who were committed to, uh, to the university system structure. So there were things like that. We also, uh, some of you may know, restructured the governance of, of neo UCOM, the Northeast Ohio University College of Medicine. We filled the last gap in, um, uh, in community colleges uh, in, uh, in Ohio by creating Eastern Gateway Community College. So, and there's room for more. I would do more with trustees. I would do other things. But, but I, I think, uh, Rick, that the main point to make here is uh, is that the changes that, that are most urgent, changes in the responsiveness on workforce uh, issues that I, that I spoke about, changes in how we approach and see economic development, responsibilities of our public universities on a day-to-day -day basis, are not going to happen through structural changes at the top. They're going to happen through a change in practice and attitude uh, every day uh, on campuses. Uh, and I find uh, I, I would not get I don't believe that you would get disagreement uh, with the urgency uh, of these, uh, of these uh, needs that I've described. What, what you get is a uh, more uh, frustrated uh, or more, uh, a greater commitment to the, uh, uh, to the current modes of practice that slow down the responsiveness to those issues. So that's, uh, those, and those things are not going to happen at the, at the top, at the organizational structure level. Those things are going to happen through, through the committed, sustained leadership um, uh, on the campuses, our presidents, our trustees, uh, our deans, uh, our provosts are going to have to make this a priority. They're going to have to speed up the, the, the changes in curriculum, speed up the processes uh, that, uh, that on campuses, frankly, take too long to, uh, to, uh, to, to happen. Eric, thank you, first of all, for your contribution. Uh, as Chancellor of the Board of Regents and the laser focus that you were able to place on the importance of higher education and its connection to economic development. What I'd like for you to speak to, though, is what I believe is a missing element. And that's the element on the front end, which is the connection of K-12 education to the success of higher ed and then ultimately to uh, economic and workforce development. So could you speak sure. to your thoughts about that? Uh, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I know that there have been several forums here this year. There, there are every year at the City Club, but particularly this year uh, about the subject of, uh, of K-12 uh, education uh, reform. Uh, let, me, uh, let me approach it this way, uh, uh, Marcia. Uh, I think that, uh, and I said in my remarks, my prepared remarks, that, that we do have uh, a challenge uh, of, uh, uh, of preparation. Uh, that uh, a lot of the students who come to, uh, to universities, uh, especially given the, the areas of focus that we need students to, uh, to participate in, you all know we call this STEM, right? It's a terrible acronym, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. We have a huge workforce crisis in this nation. I mean, it's really, um, uh, the, the, we're producing fewer and fewer uh, of, our own, uh, of our own scientists and uh, uh, and uh, mathematicians and engineers. For years, we were able to fill that gap with, uh, uh, with uh, foreign students who came here and stayed. Uh, but now that, uh, that supply is diminishing, both because of the immigration issues, which I imagine you'll have several forums on that one too, uh, but, uh, but also because there are opportunities back home. 
uh, are, are, are tremendous. They can actually do world-class science uh, where they came from. Come here, get educated, and, uh, uh, and go back and do uh, world-class science, something that wasn't uh, uh, possibly before. So we, we've, got, we've got a retiring scientific workforce, an aging scientific workforce. We're not producing the, the domestic workforce we need. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we're not uh, being able to tap into the same number of international uh, workers. We're facing, a, this is a serious crisis. This is, you're talking about the nation's, the defense of the nation. You're talking about the energy future of the nation. You're talking about the health solutions uh, you know, for the nation. All the things that, that, that we hold dear. What that means is that the level of, activ of uh, what's going to be expected on the campuses is going to go up. When I talk about curriculum changes uh, on the college campuses and the need for them, I'm really talking about higher standards, more rigor, uh, more science, more, uh, more math, more, uh, uh, more of, the, uh, uh, of the challenging. So, so the gap is going gonna, is gonna to get even uh, worse. Uh, or even more severe. So, so my answer, uh, I've, all I've done is rephrase the, the question, right? My answer is, um, <laughs> is, uh, uh, is, is uh, twofold. Uh, uh, higher education plays two uh, very important roles uh, in, uh, uh, I think, in, in K-12 uh, education and improving it. One is, of course, we train the teachers. Uh, you know, every teacher in, uh, in K-12 went to some university. Uh, and uh, uh, and to the extent that we are not preparing teachers at the level we should uh, in terms of the quality of their preparation, then that is directly on higher education, is directly uh, on, on us, uh, and it is something that uh, higher education, both public and private, uh, and uh, uh, Mrs. Dover, who's a trustee of Baldwin-Wallace College, they have a large teacher uh, uh, education program. We are all, uh, we are all in this uh, uh, in this responsibility. Uh, and we, had, we have begun in Ohio uh, to, uh, to do report cards of our colleges of education. Uh, the same way we have report cards for our K-12 schools now, uh, we should have a report card for, for uh, colleges of education, which we began to institute, uh, which tells you, um, you, you all know uh, uh, how value-added teacher measurement works, right? So one of the big controversies in K-12, it was part of the race to the top, uh, 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 competition uh, is uh, instituting the ability to measure a teacher in K-12 by how much their students have progressed over the year, the, va the so-called value-added measure. Uh, what we will be able to do once that's fully in place is track those teachers who are performing, uh, uh, who are performing best back to the schools they came from, the colleges and universities uh, from, uh, from which they came. And I think that's vital information that a superintendent of schools would like to know. Uh, how the graduates of those uh, colleges of education uh, are performing. So that's one example of something that I think we, we can do uh, directly. The second is um, that, uh, that we need to be engaged in the actual curriculum uh, at the, uh, at the uh, high school and, uh, uh, and, 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 and early uh, you know, primary and secondary level. We cannot simply sit behind uh, you know, the walls of the college or university and wait for people to come to us and then try to create the remedial programs that they're, they're just uh, it is, I mean, can you imagine, you take somebody who is, uh, who's not done, you take somebody who's not done well in, in high school, imagine a lot of these people have been out of, uh, been out of high school for a while, right? They've been working. Can you imagine uh, you've been out of high school for 10 years, you haven't taken a math class, you haven't written uh, an essay, uh, now you're told you've got to go back and get an associate degree in order to uh, progress on your job. We put you back in that same kind of classroom that you <laughs> failed in or hated or were scared of. Uh, how long are you going to last? That's exactly what goes on in, uh, you know, in, uh, in remedial education. So we've got we've to get out and, 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 and help fashion the curriculum. And frankly, part of uh, uh, K-12 reform is uh, break down the, uh, you know, break down the uh, the calendar too. You don't. There's no law uh, that says. Well, there are laws, but there's no law of nature. There's laws of the state that say you have to have four years of high school and four years of college. But there's no no law of nature that says that's the order in which you learn things uh, and the order in which you uh, you interact. So uh, we we will we will be able. We need to build uh, greater partnerships to help develop the curriculum. Uh, again, many of you are familiar with uh, in the, the STEM movement. Uh, has become uh, a place of great innovation, as have uh, many of our other our early college high schools, our, uh, some of our charter schools have become places of innovation uh, in, uh, in this area. Uh, and of course, we have a STEM school here uh, in Cleveland, uh, MC Squared, sponsored by, that was, uh, the state helped to start. The one I'm most familiar with in, 
uh, in Columbus, the Metro School, which is a, a project of Ohio State and Battelle uh, and, uh, uh, and 16 school districts uh, in central Ohio, has already graduated its first class. Uh, they all went to college. Uh, and it kind of, you know, half of them came from the Columbus City School Districts and from suburban districts around. So this is not some, uh, you know, some uh, elite uh, uh, selected group. They all went to college. Half of them had, uh, uh, had already taken college credits when they went to college. They're all performing above level in science and math. They don't need remediation. They're ahead of the game. And that comes from having a partnership that's in the, in the primary and secondary. Uh, Eric, as you, uh, as you know, the traditional uh, teaching at uh, a higher education institution is a professor standing in front of the class, and there's a class of anywhere between 10, 20 to 200 students that are out there. Uh, but the, the movement that's going on is that we have online education, we have uh, ways to project a, a uh, professor from Columbus to uh, Shanghai or, or elsewhere, and the opposite as well. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit about uh, both technology and higher education uh, and how that influences um, the way that uh, we look at economic development uh, in the state of Ohio. It's an it's a excellent question. The, the, the first half was hard enough, then, then uh, tying it to, uh, uh, to, to economic development. Uh, uh, I mean, the question uh, really states its own answer in the first half, and that is that uh, the the ability of technology to transform uh, teaching and learning is profound. It's profound in K-12. It's profound um, in, uh, in higher education. Uh, I, I will tell you there's more change happening on campuses than you probably think. Um, you know, the, one, of the, one of the problems of, of, uh, of a topic like this is that we're not all on college campuses every day, uh, so you don't really know what's happening in each, uh, uh, in each class, in each uh, classroom. Uh, we had a a program we started at the Board of Regents uh, called the uh, Faculty Innovators Award. Uh, we took $10,000 a year, gave out 10 $1,000 uh, 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 grants, which is obviously not much, but for you know, faculty members, a $1,000 award is, uh, uh, is significant. We invited students, faculty, deans to nominate people across the state. Uh, and we are now uh, finishing our third year of this, so we've had 30 awards so far. And the idea is to really to, to show people, lift up the examples uh, of, of true innovation in the use of technology, both to lower cost textbooks and such, um, which, are, uh, which, which are easy to, the costs are easy to reduce uh, given available technology, uh, but also to improve teaching and learning. Right, it's 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 got to be both. Uh, in many ways, you know this. It's it's, it's the same thing in K twelve as it is in higher ed. Uh, the the classroom model is going to completely flip. Uh, the question implied this that you don't need a, a lecturer in front of uh, in front of the class. In fact, you can get the best college lectures available in the world online for free. Uh, you know, you can watch MIT's uh, lectures online for free. The, you, many of you know about the Khan Academy. There's all sorts of uh, of, of uh, access to free lectures, why would you, uh, why do you need to go to a class to watch a lecture um, and then go home and try to struggle with problems? Uh, we, we can flip it, right? Uh, go home and watch the lecture, uh, which is available uh, on, your, uh, on your laptop, uh, and then come to class to work with, uh, to work with uh, professors who help you uh, with problem-based uh, learning. So there is a, there is a transformation uh, underway, uh, and uh, uh, of course we would all like it to accelerate faster uh, than it is, uh, but I think we are getting to a critical mass on technology in the classroom, uh, and it, uh, it truly is going to transform. Uh, you will not, uh, all, everybody who cherishes your, uh, your college experience uh, of sitting in the back of the large lecture hall on Monday morning after a long weekend of, uh, of, uh, of whatever you were doing over the weekend, uh, and, uh, and not being disturbed, uh, those days are coming to an end. Uh, one of the things about technology in the classroom and online learning is you can't hide. Uh, so this is actually a significant improvement in, uh, in, uh, in teaching and learning, uh, as well as, uh, as often a uh, uh, cost saving. So uh, I, to me, the link to economic development uh, to me is, is really, it could be endless, uh, but uh, in part, uh, it, is, uh, it is those skill sets that, that our, our students need when they graduate. Uh, you know, to return to one of the themes that I that I uh, uh, articulated in my, uh, in my prepared remarks, I, I, and I really believe this very strongly, um, that uh, this, uh, uh, this disconnect between uh, what we are turning out 
and what businesses are, are needing and looking for is real. Uh, don't kid yourself, uh, it's real. Uh, and it is a serious uh, problem uh, for our state and for our country. Uh, I, I will tell you that I, I believe without any question, if you, any college or university representative in this room today or listening uh, on a broadcast, if you train people in, uh, in the relevant skills, they will have a job. They will have a job. You are not going to graduate without a job. In fact, many, you will have a job before you graduate uh, if you are being trained in the relevant, uh, uh, in the relevant skills. Uh, and, uh, and so this notion, this old notion we have that, well, you go to college, you get your degree, and then we hope the economy's good enough out there uh, for you to, you know, for there to be a job for you, is really just, just outdated. Um, it is a question of the skills. If you have the relevant skills, you have a job. Um, and if you don't, you don't. I don't know if you saw, uh, there was a study released last week uh, by the Center for Workforce uh, at Georgetown University, which is one of the most famous, uh, uh, the best known academic centers that studies uh, this, uh, this issue. Tony, Car Tony Carnavali is a well-known professor, the director of, uh, of the Institute. Uh, they studied, uh, the census data now gives them access to wages, earnings, tied back to uh, the ma your major in college. Um, and they studied 172 majors and ranked them uh, by, the average, uh, you know, by the average earnings. And it's no surprise engineering was you know, way off at the top and the, techno you know, the technological uh, fields was, uh, were all way off at the top. So, um, so it will create jobs. Uh, there are businesses that will tell you um, uh, if they're honest, that their only limit on how fast they grow, their only limit on how fast they grow uh, is, uh, is their ability to get workers with the proper skills. You do not know the jobs you've not created in this city because you didn't have, uh, because we didn't have workers uh, with the right skills. You'll never know. You know, most of our companies, uh, to speak to the economic development uh, 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 point of the question, most of our companies are part of larger organizations, right? Uh, they are they're one plant that belongs to a parent company uh, that has facilities all over the world. So what happens is uh, when, the, when the parent company has a new product they're going to develop uh, or a new contract uh, to deliver uh, product, they look across their system and they ask themselves, where should we make this? Which one of our uh, subsidiary companies, which one of our plants should we use uh, to make this? Uh, to make this product, and the answer is going to be not only cost, but the answer is going to be can you produce the workforce to gear up to, to fulfill that contract immediately? Not you have two years, right? They're not going to call uh, Cuyahoga Community College and say, okay, uh, you've got two years to produce for us uh, associate degree candidates in uh, you know in a certain uh, uh, you know in a certain field, or call uh, Tom Shema and say in four years we need uh, we need to no, they need it today. Uh, and that decision that gets made, we never know about, you never know about three quarters of those decisions uh, that, uh, that were opportunities that we could have had to have jobs uh, in this community or in this state uh, if we had the proper workforce. It's, it's, the, it's the issue, uh, it's the economic development issue of, uh, of the moment. Thanks for taking my question, Mr. Pingott. I graduated a few weeks ago with student debt I also studied finance, so naturally my question would be about the cost of education. Yeah. How can Ohio and our universities solve the problem of rapidly increasing cost of education while the state share of instruction and state appropriations yeah. to the public universities continues to be reduced? So I'm going to be the, uh, uh, I'll be the contrarian. Uh, a little bit here too. I think I've I've probably played that role a couple times today. So uh, you know, in for a dime, in for a dollar. Uh, the um, uh, the we tend to approach this question uh, as if higher education is one product, right? One monolithic uh, uh, product, um, and and somehow we think it should all cost the same, uh, uh, and uh, and so when. When Denison University uh, the other day uh, went over $50,000 for the first time, there's a headline uh, in the Columbus Dispatch, you know, college costs now $50,000 a year. Uh, well, that's one uh, intensive, small, uh, you know, liberal arts environment, and that's what the cost structure uh, of that type of, uh, 
uh, of school is. But you can also go uh, to, uh, you know, to your local community college for two years uh, and uh, for an average of about $3,000 a year, uh, get uh, two full years of your bachelor's degree, and then go to whatever uh, university you want to go to for the last two years, and you've just saved thousands and thousands of dollars. In fact, uh, last time I checked, I, I don't have my most current uh, data. You know, I've been out of office for two months, so, uh, so don't, don't, uh, you know, don't throw uh, darts at me if I, if I get some of the numbers exactly wrong. But uh, you could go uh, to uh, Columbus State in downtown Columbus, uh, the community college in central Ohio, uh, and on that campus, you could stay and get a bachelor's degree from Ohio University, the very same Ohio University that, uh, you know, that is headquartered in beautiful Athens, Ohio. The total cost of your bachelor's degree, total cost of your bachelor's degree, $15,000. Not per year, total cost. Now, it's the same Ohio University on your diploma that you go to if you go spend four years in Athens. Now, I'm not saying anything negative about going to spend four years in Athens. It's a beautiful place. It's a wonderful place. You get all sorts of other uh, amenities uh, involved in it, the college life, the, um, you know, the uh, uh, sports, and uh, all the things associated with it. But there's no way those things are going to cost the same. So what, 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 I cha what, what we challenged ourselves to do is to have as many low-cost pathways as possible so students can make their choices. Uh, and, uh, and frankly, that's also why you know, I'm such a believer in public uh, uh, higher education as an option, because that also is a choice for you. I, I went to uh, private universities, right? So clearly, I also understand the price and value of those, and I taught it to, um, the, the price and value of theirs. The, the, the point, again, is there are many choices. Um, I believe our job is to make as many choices available to you um, the, as possible. Uh, I, can, I can say with all honesty that your abil the, at the, the ability to get an affordable college education in Ohio has improved every year uh, that I have been involved in this business. It doesn't mean that you choose it, um, uh, but it means uh, it, is, uh, it is available to you. Our goal is to make sure they are all high quality options um, and, uh, and then to uh, assist people uh, in, in making the choices. If you choose to go for four years to Athens, you're going to end up a little bit more in debt, a lot more in debt probably, um, than, than if you chose a different path. Uh, you are, we need to make sure you know those choices, uh, that, you, uh, that you enter into them uh, willingly uh, and openly, uh, but, but it would be wrong for us to cross-subsidize, to raise the cost of people who choose another option in order to uh, subsidize those who are uh, who are choosing uh, the other options. But of course, we want to keep it all as cheap, as, as, po as, low, as low cost as we possibly can. That part, I'll agree with you. Okay. Very, thank you for mentioning Ohio University. That's my alma mater. <laughs> so I got a good education I, there. I, I did that for you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the biggest problems in getting the students from kindergarten up to the high school level that that lady was talking about a few minutes ago is money. And at one time, I don't know if you will remember, but your mother will, that you only paid, I had a levy once every 20 years. And now we have them every three years. And that's because of House Bill 920, which was put into the Constitution of Ohio. And it needs to come out of there. So I wanted to know if in and this really doesn't affect you directly, but because you were in the administration, you might know if anything at all can be done to get that out of the Constitution. The second, I have two-part question. The second one is, um, in vocation... First part is no, so we'll go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that was an easy answer. Okay. Uh, that, that's unfortunate because yeah. we need a movement to get rid of House Bill I'll, 920. I'll, I'll okay. a little bit. Yeah, right. But <laughs> the second thing is, in a lot of vocational schools, which are really very good for a lot of kids, they take the teachers from the industries and have them be the teachers. Yeah. So was there any consideration in your working with the colleges to do the same thing, to take maybe one person for a year or two from a business that needs certain things to get that going in a college atmosphere? Yeah, absolutely. I, I will focus on the second because I know we're, we're, we're close to being out of time. and. Uh, and 
like you, Mayor, I, I wish we could do something about the, uh, uh, about the constraints on, uh, on K-12 school funding in Ohio. Um, but but I, I actually want to lift up the part of your question about the, uh, the so-called vocational schools. Um, this is actually a huge success story in Ohio, um, in most parts of the state, by the way, unfortunately not in the urban centers, uh, because uh, school districts were allowed to join together and create joint vocational districts to pass levies. The urban districts opted out. They said, we'll do it ourselves. Um, and these multiple levies across, you have a small levy across a large, large area generates some real money. Uh, and we've got some very, very fine um, uh, technical uh, programs that our high school students in this state uh, have, have access to. And the exciting thing about this is that it was typically considered to be the non-college track. Today, more kids are going to college out of the technical programs um, than they are out of those who remain uh, back in the regular high school uh, because we're teaching them the scientific and technical skills that are demonstrated to be uh, uh, successful uh, components uh, of, uh, uh, of a college education. What we were working to do and we are doing is to uh, what we call articulate those programs. Make sure we know how much college credit. If you had taken that at Tri-C, how much credit would you have gotten for it? Make sure you get that credit and encourage uh, those students uh, to continue to go on. I'll bet you we're going to get more of this, we're going to solve more of this scientific workforce crisis that I described earlier out of kids who came through the JVS system than some of our traditional high schools. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to Eric Fingerhut at our Friday Forum. Thank you very much, Mr. Fingerhut. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.